Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, an imaginative storm podcast offering you fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always broadcasting first on WPVM LP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online, WPVMFM.org, the voice of Asheville heard all over the world, and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio, coming out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, Walter Parks. Com if you're interested in more of Walter's music. Thank you, Devine Dial, for managing WPVM-FM. If any of you listening would like to know more about community radio, WPVM-FM is a good place to start. And if you would ever like to join me for our Imaginative Storm writing workshop on Saturday, noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, you will find the Zoom link at imaginativestorm.com. The door is always open. There's never a charge for that. Imaginativestorm.com. And I also want to remind you on December the 18th at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be offering A Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Thomas. I'll perform it. It's a 30-minute program, and if you would like to join me, you can go to jamesnave.com, and there you will find the Zoom link. And so on the subject of A Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Thomas, what I would like to do in this program is go solo today and talk about a subject that people often ask me about, memorization. A Child's Christmas in Wales is about a 23 to 25 minute performance, which means memorizing 23 to 25 minutes of material. If you happen to be a trained actor, you will know that 25 minutes of material is an ordinary experience. You will have had more than one occasion to memorize 25 or more minutes of material and then perform it after long rehearsals for an audience, sometimes large and sometimes small. So if you're an actor and a memorizer, you know that while it's not easy to memorize a 25, 30 minutes worth of material, it's well within your range because what you know and what I have learned over the years is that it's about taking your time and working with the material until eventually you get it. Now, some actors have to memorize massive amounts of material very fast, and I have known some people who are really quick with it. Most people like me, it takes a while. I have to work with it. I have to play around with it. I have to spend time with the material. I have to most especially not be in a hurry when I'm memorizing something. The idea of not being in a hurry runs counter to most of the ways you might have been taught to memorize, or if you've never had the opportunity to have someone help you with it, maybe you had to do it on your own. Who knows? Maybe it was easy for you. Most people tell me they have a somewhat difficult time memorizing, and most people will say, or many people have said, they can't do it at all which is an interesting proposition, really, when you think about it, because actually we memorize all the time. We remember people's names. We remember numbers. We remember how to get from point A to point B. We remember how much change we have in our pockets or close to it. We remember the distances between places, and on and on it goes. Every memory you have was memorized. It was taken in lodged in your body, put somewhere in there, which brings up an interesting idea around memories and memorization. I once thought it all went in my head. I would memorize a line and it would go in my head. And now I'm beginning to think maybe these memories are housed throughout our bodies. You might have a poem lodged in your knee, your left knee, or in your left little finger, or your nose. I don't know if we lodge our memories throughout our body. I have no idea. But when I think about the body as a memory container rather than just the brain, it makes me smile. It actually relieves me a little bit, and it makes me curious about intake. How do we take in all of these memories and how do we keep them all? We keep them all because we've taken them in. The question really isn't, do I remember? The question is really more about, can I access all of the memories? And the answer is probably not. 
Even so, if you noodle around a bit and if you write and play around and be fanciful and imaginative, you'll be surprised at how many memories pop out that you didn't know you had had. In the imaginative storm work that I do with my creative collaborator Allegra Houston, I'll often quote a bit of verse from Charles Wright in the form of a question, and here it is. I've done this before on the air. You might have already heard me say it once. It's worth repeating. What is it inside your imagination that keeps surprising you at odd moments when something is given back you didn't know you had had in solitude, spontaneously, and with great joy? I have revised that just a little bit, actually. The original text reads like this. What is it inside the imagination that keeps surprising us at odd moments when something is given back we didn't know we had had in solitude, spontaneously, and with great joy? I like the idea of asking the question first, what is it inside your imagination? Yet Charles Wright, a terrific poet, makes it more universal by saying, what is it inside the imagination? As if the imagination is more than just you, more than just me. Could it be the imagination is the collective consciousness that contains all things? I would like to think so. Regardless, when you take things in, you remember them. They're there somewhere, even if you're not able to access everything. And who can? But by knowing that it's somehow there, there's a level of confidence that comes with that knowledge. I do have all of these things inside of me. I retain them all. I contain, as Walt Whitman said, multitudes. And of course, what is it inside the imagination that keeps surprising us? Implied in that, the imagination will surprise us all the time. It's not an exclusive thing one person has and another person doesn't. The imagination is rather democratic. If you let your imagination run free, surprise, surprise, something will come up, something will happen. And likely in the process of the coming up and the happening, it won't be long until a smile appears on your face. You start to grin, sometimes ear to ear, and that's not so bad, I think. So these big broad sweeps and ideas about collective consciousness are all well and good, but what about memorization? What about a child's Christmas in Wales? How come I can remember 25 minutes of that material? What's going on there? How do you do that? Well, you do it by starting with short pieces rather than long pieces. When I first memorized a poem, I attempted, and indeed succeeded, months later in memorizing Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. It was a 72-line poem, still is, and I do know it. I do have it down, but I was tormented with all of the terrible, terrible missteps that one brings to the memorization process. For example, I copied the poem, I sat down, thought I would be able to accomplish the memorization process in short period of time. So I hurried through it and I would repeat the lines and repeat the lines and try to remember them and repeat them and try to remember them. And at first all that happened to me was frustration and I started to think I was dumb, and I started to wonder why I couldn't retain all of those lines. I didn't know I was going at it the absolute wrong way. So, the best way to start, and if you would like to memorize a poem right now, we're going to do that together. Best way to start is start with a short poem. Let's give it a try by starting with what I think is officially the second shortest poem in the world, and then we will move to the first shortest poem. So when we're through with this little session, which won't last long, you will know two poems. So here we are. Are you ready to memorize your first poem, the second shortest poem in the world? So here it goes. Actually, the title is longer than the poem, so get ready. Here it is. On the Antiquity of Fleas. I'll say that again so you can remember the title. On the Antiquity of Fleas. So here it is. Adam Haddam. Adam Haddam. That was on the Antiquity of Fleas. Likely you'll remember that. It's short enough. Now let's move on to the shortest poem ever written 
and it was written by Muhammad Ali, who was a great word crafter. He understood rhythms and rhymes, and he was actually not only a boxer, he was, guess what, a published poet. So here is the shortest poem in the world composed by Muhammad Ali. Me, we. Me, we. So now you have likely memorized two poems on the antiquity of fleas. Adam had em. Me, we. By Muhammad Ali. Even in those short poems, there's a lot of language playfulness, a lot of fun. They're light and easy, and yet, if you pull back and think about it, there's a lot of depth there as well. So that's what makes poetry work. It doesn't have to be long. Adam had him. Me, we. Two poems. If I'd known about taking my time and memorizing shorter material, I would have had a lot more fun trying to memorize Ulysses. But I was in a hurry. I wanted to get it right. I wanted to get it down. So thus the frustration. It never, ever occurred to me that I could just simply take my time and indulge myself with each line as if the line was the only part of the poem. No 72 lines, no long poem, just one phrase, one line, one image. Never occurred to me that I could do that. I think the reason why we tend to hurry memorization, and in fact we tend to hurry a lot of things in our lives, not just memorization. I'm always in a hurry, or at least I feel like often I am in a hurry, and that may be because we live in such a fast-paced, industrialized, work-a-day culture that demands of us to deliver, to get it done, to get the job right, to make something of ourselves, to be successful, which I think is fine. It's a great driver to have all of those things. Unfortunately, sometimes those pressures bleed into one's creative life, one's artistic pursuits. When you're working in your creative pursuits, slowing down is always really nice. Lowers the blood pressure, makes the eyes twinkle a bit. I'm thinking about people who fish. Fishing is an art. All you have to do is ask someone who ties flies for trout fishing and they will tell you it is an art they've been practicing and they've yet to perfect it. Of course then some of the people who sit by the bank and toss the line in and wait for the fish to come along, they, they would tell you they're practicing art as well. Point is when you're fishing, you're relaxed, you're tossing your line, really do you care if you ever catch a fish? Maybe, sure, you want to catch a fish. It's the experience. That also happens when you're out walking around, say, a lake, and you're casually looking for the birds to fly by. It doesn't really matter if the bird flies by in the next five minutes or if the bird never flies by at all. But when one does fly by, there's a beauty to it. So when you're practicing your art, it does allow you to relax. And memorization is the same thing. Think of it as fishing. One small line, a line of poetry, a line of prose, like the line tossed into the lake, slowly floats over the water and then lands with a little ripple out. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you absorb the experience of waiting, watching that thin line float on the lake or downstream if you're trout fishing, never worrying about the fish but enjoying the sun. It's the experience. So when you are memorizing, what you're actually doing is allowing the material that's in front of you to cue you to have some kind of relaxed, imaginative experience, not unlike sitting by the, the lake with the line in the water. And yet, when you leave the lake, and maybe you have a fish, maybe you don't, but when you leave the lake and you go home and you talk to somebody you care about, somebody you love, and you tell them about your afternoon fishing, 
You tell them about all of it. The fish becomes secondary. So when you're memorizing a line, a verse or prose poetry or just prose, the process of letting your imagination wrap its entire universe around the, the, the line and come up with something from your own experience, from those deep memories that you have, and apply it to the line, you cease to really worry about whether it's going to be a three-minute experience or an hour. You can spend a whole day thinking about a couple of lines. You may be thinking as you're listening to this that you don't have any time to sit down and memorize a piece of writing just for the sake of memorizing it. And I get it. Again, that's why I'm talking about the very short, easy things rather than the long haul types of memorization. But beyond that, when we talk about memorization, there's more to it than taking in a couple of lines of poetry or, or prose. We're really talking about slowing down and allowing yourself to increase your awareness of the environment that's around you. I mean, for example, wherever you are right now listening to this, you are in an environment, and it's likely an environment that you are familiar with, unless you're traveling and listening to this on the road, and then things are zipping by that you haven't seen. But most likely, you are somewhere in an, in an environment that you know. Well, take a moment and look around the environment you're in right now, and think about the stories that surround you. How about the picture on the wall of somebody you know, or the keys on the counter, or maybe a lamp on the desk that somebody gave you for a birthday gift? That picture on your wall, did you take a photograph and frame it? Is it a family heirloom passed down from a, an aunt or an uncle, your grandmother or your grandfather? The more you look at the photograph, the more you will start to take in not only the photograph, but the environment around the photograph, and in fact, the environment around you. This is memorization. It's about paying attention to one thing and allowing your imagination to fill in the blanks around that one thing. Let your imagination fancifully answer the, the questions. Maybe your grandmother gave you the photograph. Maybe it's a picture when she was young going on a trip. Maybe she went on a long walk around Europe, for example, and someone photographed her, and it's a picture of her when she was very young, and it's been in the family a long time, and now you have it. What's that backstory? And if you look at the picture long enough and you think about those things long enough, that moment upon gazing at the picture will be indelibly placed in your memory as an event. A singular event, something you remember for a long time, and all you have done is sit in your room and look at one thing, and you've memorized the entire moment, the entire situation, the whole room becomes part of who you are. So this is what memorization is, and this is why when you change your perspective around how you take information in, and you start looking at all of the information you have to take in as a memorization phenomenon rather than just something you have to remember like the directions to the store it becomes a lot more interesting and it suggests to you and to all of us really that if we pause for a moment and pay attention to the things we're looking at we will start to fill in the blanks now i'm thinking of those images that often appear online when you have a sentence or maybe two or three sentences and many of the letters are left out and yet you can still read the sentence as if the letters were in there because your mind is putting the letters in even though the letters don't exist so if that's the case with two or three sentences you know that's the case with with all the things we look at so when we stop just glancing at the photograph on the wall. Maybe the photograph 
is covered in glass. Maybe the glass is reflecting other objects in the room, but when you glance at the photograph, you might not at first see those other objects being reflected in the glass that's covering the photograph of your grandmother who was walking on her journey uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Probably a black and white photograph, just for the record, but the images reflecting off the glass might be in color. So as you move closer and closer into your attention around whatever image you choose, you really do start to fill in all kinds of information that you at first didn't see. So coming back to memorizing two or three lines of prose or poetry, it's really a way of allowing your imagination to expand itself, your playfulness to expand, your fancy to expand. And all of these elements are part of your creative abundance. You were born with more creativity than you will ever be able to use in, a, in your lifetime. It's really a matter of awareness, organization, and figuring out how you're going to engage your birthright of creativity. So if you haven't ever considered memorizing anything before now, let's look at it a little more closely. First of all, you already have two poems memorized just in the last 21 minutes. Adam had him, me, we. You took those two little pieces in because it was easy and it was kind of fun. Probably made you chuckle. Adam had him. That is kind of funny to say. On the other hand, me, we, by Muhammad Ali, is a little more serious. Either way, both are easy to remember because they're short. Short is good for starters, that said. You don't really have to keep it short. You could start out with something long like Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson, which is what I did. Short or long or in between, one of the first pieces of advice I give people when they ask me how to memorize, I tell them, don't memorize. And what I'm really saying when I say don't memorize, I'm suggesting to avoid all of the traditional approaches to memorization. And I've already mentioned those, like when I learned Ulysses, I sat down and went one line at a time trying to remember the words. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags. That's how the poem opens. And so I sat there repeating over and over again, it little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags. Okay, I almost have it. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags. So I repeated it over and over again and again, trying to remember the words. But what I forgot to do, or what I didn't know to do, was to, first of all, instead of trying to quote unquote memorize it i didn't bother to go through the entire poem and actually learn the story basically the story is ulysses has come back from his sailing trip around the world he's found his kingdom he's wandering around the kingdom with nothing to do because he would rather be on the sea the sea is calling him and as he sits there contemplating his older age, he's growing older every single day, he remembers all the good times he had and the bad times on the sea. And he looks down at the harbor and he sees the ships that he brought in, now waiting quietly there for somebody to board them. He thinks about his son, he thinks about his wife, he thinks about his kingdom. Everything is in order, all is well. He isn't relevant anymore. Nobody cares about Ulysses. Even though he's the king, really the son has taken over. So Ulysses is sitting there thinking, well, what am I going to do next? And then he starts to look out on the, the dark, broad seas. And then he starts to think about his mariners and all the people that he traveled with. And then he decides, well, you know, I think I'm just going to give up the kingdom and I'm going to head back out. And then he gives a call to action and says, come, my friends, it is not too late to seek a newer world. So Ulysses is thinking about his, his old age. He's really thinking about his death. And in the poem, he says, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. And then he goes on to talk about what he's going to do when he sails out. The poem ends 
with the last lines, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Now, we never know if Ulysses ever gets back on the boat. Maybe he dies right after he finishes his thinking around what he would like to do, or maybe he does get on the boat, and as he says, he'll sail beyond the the baths of all the western stars until he dies. So that's the story, my telling of the story. So what I didn't do when I first started to memorize Ulysses, I didn't bother to get the story. I thought I'm supposed to sit down and memorize the, the lines, it little profits that an idle king by this still hearth, over and over. And no wonder it took me forever to do it, because it didn't occur to me to build the story out in my imagination first, and then put the words in as I went along. Another thing I tell people when they're thinking about memorizing, I say the mistakes are where the action is. What you think you're forgetting is actually your memory calibrating and calculating so that it actually puts the phrases and the words in place and they will eventually flow out as they appear on the page. But that happens at the very end of the process. And I've often thought about the situations in schools, and you may have experienced this yourself. You're, you're in the schoolroom, say maybe you're in the seventh or the eighth grade, and I don't know how much of this goes on now in schools because many of the teachers that I know will tell me that testing is so important that they've dropped the language arts. It's just science and math, and can you deliver the answers for the test? I don't know if that's true or not. But back in the day when people did have more language arts in the classroom and they did ask people to memorize, they would assign memorization. Say like, for example, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and the frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there's some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. You're probably familiar with that poem. Maybe you were asked to memorize it when you were in school. Now, here's the rub, or at least this used to be the rub. After you memorized the poem, and every student in the class had to memorize the poem, everybody was asked to stand up and recite the poem for the teacher. Now, the way you were graded on the poem, if you got all the words right, you passed. But if you got one or two wrong, it was considered a failure. Well, what I have discovered in memorization, what was considered a failure was actually where the successes sat in the, in the process of learning the poem by heart. And again, I should say memorization wouldn't hurt to translate memorization into learning by heart because the heart is much more generous, I suspect, than the brain. So I've often thought it was really kind of funny that if you took a math test and you, say, maybe missed two, two problems out of 20, you would get a fairly high grade. But if you took a memorization test, which means you have to get every word right, you fail if you miss one word, or at least that's how your psychology registers it. So when you are memorizing, instead of thinking, I'm failing because I don't remember it, and that's what I did when I was trying to memorize Ulysses. I always thought I was a big failure, when in fact what I was actually doing was succeeding because I was taking the information in and slowly lodging it into my, my body all of those memory banks that exist in your body. Maybe, who knows, my Ulysses is in my left knee. I'm not sure where it is, but I know that it is embedded in there. And the only reason that 
lands for a lot of people is because it's been in the school textbooks forever and it is one of the more popular poems that people remember. So by not memorizing, you are allowing yourself to dwell with the poem. You're allowing yourself to develop a relationship with it. You're also allowing your imagination to do the same thing that it might do if you're looking at the photograph of your grandmother when she was young. You fill in all kinds of stories that belong to you. So let's just take the first few lines of Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost as an example. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So instead of memorizing the entire poem, first of all, you get a sense of what's going on in the poem. The fellow's driving somewhere. He's in a sleigh. He has a horse. The sleigh has runners on it. He knows the land he's traversing because he's likely done it many times. He knows who the owner is, maybe even knows the owner. The owner lives in the village. He's a little worried because he doesn't want the owner to know that he's passing through and stopping on the owner's land. He notes a few of the details of the winter, the wind and the snow, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. He knows all of this. He pauses and then he goes on because he has somewhere to get to and he can't tarry for long. There's your story. Okay, once you have that story firmly fixed in your mind, then you can hang the words on the story rather than memorizing the words and then trying to create a story to hang the words on. So it's actually the reverse of what you think it would be. So it's a lot of fun to tell stories. You know, man in woods on sleigh stops, worries about owner chasing him. He skedaddles because he has somewhere to go. Not as poetic as Robert Frost, but it's the same idea. It's the same story. So once you understand the story of the, of the poem, like Adam had him, well, the Garden of Eden. Were there fleas in the Garden of Eden? We must presume perhaps there were fleas in the Garden of Eden. I don't know. I wasn't there. There were animals. Animals do have fleas. So maybe Adam was bitten by a flea. There's your story, and you could build that story out for an entire hour if you wanted to go on and on about fleas in the Garden of Eden, Adam, the snake, and God. And of course, me, we. You're addressing yourself first. Me. Where do I belong? Where do I place myself in the world that I live in, populated by billions? The we's, the me's. Well, every story you tell has a me in it and a we in it. We are all there. We are all part of that collective consciousness that I was talking about earlier. What is it inside the imagination that keeps surprising us at odd moments, as Charles Wright said. So coming back to stopping by woods on a snowy evening. So when you first start to memorize the poem, you get the story. And you get that down so you can tell it without the words in the poem, or maybe you might throw in a couple. And after you have that story down, then go back to the, the first part and start to look at the lines in the same way that you observe your environment. Look at them closely without trying to remember the words, but more trying to let the lines cue you, cue your imagination to create circumstances around those lines so that when you start to plug the words into the circumstances that you have created on your own, those circumstances uniquely belonging to you, the words will start to fall into place and you will find that some words will stick faster than others the ones that don't stick, as I said earlier, are not mistakes of memory loss. The words that aren't sticking are just little opportunities for you to develop out more story until the words just simply fall into place. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So you know it's snowing, you know the man is driving through the woods, 
You know that he's going somewhere? Whose woods these are? I think I know. So the first thing you do with that first line, whose woods these are? I think I know. So here are some of the questions you could ask. What do the woods look like? Am I in New England? Am I in Colorado? You do have to place yourself somewhere in a snowy environment. So likely you wouldn't be in the Everglades in Florida driving through the snow. Not possible. Doesn't snow in Florida enough to have snow on the ground to drive a sleigh across. So likely it's New England. You do know Robert Frost was in New England. Now, if you live in Florida and you've never seen snow, it's a different imaginative process than say, for example, if you grew up in Vermont. Every winter, more snow than you know what to do with. You've probably been in a sleigh with a horse, likely, and if you haven't, you've likely seen one. If you're out in the West, say, around the upper elevations of Colorado where it snows all the time, it would be a different experience. But there are feelings that come with it. You're cold. The snow is falling. How deep is the snow? How thick is the forest? What time of day is it? When did you start? Are you hungry? Are you cold? Did you bother to bundle up? How long have you owned the horse? Is this your first drive on a sleigh, or is this something you've done many, many, many times? How many seasons have you played in the woods? Whose woods these are, I think I know, implying that the owner owns the woods. And yet, do you own the woods as well because you played in the woods when you were a child? Whose woods these are, I think I know. Well, if you realize that you own the woods as much as the person who owns the deed to the woods, that changes the vibe. Whose woods these are, I think I know. And then you do, you do know the owner. His house is in the village. Well, his house in the village, is it large? Is it small? What kind of interactions have you had with the owner? S doesn't sound like it's a relative. Maybe the owner is the mayor of the village. So all of these decisions can happen around that first line. So you still haven't really bothered to learn the wor words yet. Whose woods these are? That's your question. Whose woods these are? I think I know. So you think you know, but maybe you don't know. Maybe you're trying to figure it out as you go. His house is in the village, though he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So there's a little quirk right there. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. His house is in the village, though. Or his house is in the village, though he will not s see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So as you start to memorize, you'll start to rearrange even the way the words come across. So as I'm playing around with who owns the woods and who belongs there and all of these things, the text is beginning to find its way into my memory without me putting forth a whole lot of effort like I did when I was trying to memorize Ulysses. Suddenly, whose woods these are, there's your opening for stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are? So that would be likely when you do the imaginative work that I've just done, that will be the first thing that you would remember. Whose woods these are? Whose woods these are? Hmm. Oh, I, I, th I think I know. So even the way you phrase it becomes different than just rote. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. That would be how somebody would recite it. But once you have a full-bodied experience around that question, whose woods these are, it becomes a universal question. Like, whose life is this? I think I know. Is it your life? Does your life belong to someone else? And on and on and on it goes. So whatever it is you want to learn, again, keep it short. Whose woods these are? It's not that far from Adam Haddam or me, we. Whose woods these are? And that's the opening of stopping by woods on a snowy evening. So likely, about right now, 
you are probably going to remember the opening of Stopping My Woods on a Snowy Evening, whose woods these are. And you may have already started to answer the questions that I posed for myself, and by extension, I posed for you as well. Of course, your answers, your woods, your experiences will be very different from mine, even though the text is exactly the same. And once you get it all memorized, you will have the words in place as Robert Frost wrote them. But what you will have also will be a story in place that nobody else on earth could have ever thought of because you have constructed that story out of your own experience. In the poem Ulysses, Ulysses says, I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch, where through gleams that untraveled world, whose margin fades forever and forever as I move. I am a part of all that I've met. You too are a part of all that you have met. So th that's how you can create these terrific dynamic stories around the opening line, the opening phrase, the opening little bit, whose woods these are. And that can also become a dialogue in a, in a poem that you could write. You could take that one line and generate all kinds of things from it. Whose woods these are? And you could go on from, from there for hours and hours about your childhood memories, the parks you've been in, the woods you've wandered through, you know, the wildernesses of your life that you've had to negotiate and navigate. So now you have a better sense of how to, to start memorizing, learning by heart. And now you know it's something you can take your time with. You don't have to hurry. I mean, after all, this idea of keen awareness around things that circle you in your daily life or the poems you decide to memorize or the other things that you need to remember, the learning by heart process, it's an ongoing lifetime proposition. So as I said, I memorized Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales many, many years ago and have been performing it every Christmas since. In fact, the first time I performed it, I recited it, performed it, got through it in 1987 with a friend of mine named Selena Lotterer. Selena was in college at UNCG at the time and I had stopped by for a visit on my way back to Asheville from a road trip and we had a little bit of time and decided to go see uh, Fried Green Tomatoes. I don't know why I remember that movie and we had some time before the the movie started and so I performed it in the car. She sat in the driver's seat and listened. That was that. I got through it. I was pleased about it and it was around Christmas time. So that was my first Christmas performance. I think I spent another year working on it before I actually gathered people together and offered it as a, a an official performance. But that's my first memory of having one person in front of me when I recited the poem. So the reason I'm bringing that up is because that was a long time ago. And now, all these years later, I have had many, 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 many opportunities to perform A Child's Christmas in Wales for I don't know how many people. There was a time when I've performed it with two children and they did the children's parts of A Child's Christmas in Wales, plus a few other parts. And then I continued on after the children grew up, I continued to do it by myself and on and on it went. So now, all of this time later, all of these years later, I'm still rehearsing it, I'm still going over it. Talk about slow, do the math. I don't even know how many years have gone by, but I am now, in a place in my life where the character in A Child's Christmas in Wales, the old man remembering back on his childhood in Wales, telling the story to uh, a, a young boy who's asked about how it, it was way back when, and then the man tells the story. So prior to reciting the poem for Selena Lauderer, I spent many, many months trying to remember all the words, and I think in the process of trying to take in such a long poem, I discovered some of the ideas that I've been talking about in this show. 
I discovered that I couldn't just take the words in and remember it. So I had to really work out the story, what was going on in each beat. And then in my effort to remember the words, I danced the words. I created movements out of them. And I never held back. I just started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what I noticed coming back to the photograph with your grandmother uh, on her journey when she was very young, what I started to notice was when I was in a room and I was memorizing the poem by moving around and making these big gestures and, and movements, I started to memorize the whole room. So for a while when I recited the poem or recited the lines I had memorized, I could see the entire room I was in along with the images I was trying to develop around the piece. So years and years and years go by and I am now at a place where I really, really do feel quite comfortable with all of the words of the poem. That said, I am still discovering more and more and more about the piece. It's as if every time I say it aloud, it's a brand new proposition. So you might ask me, have I ever memorized A Child's Christmas in Wales? And I would answer you saying, sure, I know the words. I would also answer you by saying, well, I'm still memorizing it. I'm still understanding it. My heart is still getting to know the piece. Well, that's probably true with everything you take in. Because are we not getting to know ourselves throughout our lives in relationship to all those things around us? Wouldn't it be reasonable to think if we pay closer attention to those around us, the objects as well, as, and closer attention to ourselves, things would be richer, life would be more expanded, or at least one's imagination would expand more. So that's why when you memorize, please do. Just take your time. Don't hurry and let it dwell. Let the, let the ideas dwell with inside of you. So in A Child's Christmas in Wales, it opens with a man. Of course, it's easy to presume it's an old man, although from the, from the boy's point of view, the character in the poem, anybody over 20 would be considered old to a six-year-old boy or an eight-year-old boy. So who knows? This man telling the story is thinking back to his childhood in Wales, trying to remember. So here we are, back to the memory part. A Child's Christmas in Wales is, is a poem that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It starts on the afternoon of the day of Christmas Eve, and it ends on Christmas night. And it takes you through the memories of the man trying to piece together what was and wasn't there throughout his childhood. So you never know if it's a specific Christmas, but there are many Christmases collaged into one in the story. Now, that's true with all of our memories. We collage all of it together. I don't have a calendar inside my imagination I'm looking at. You know, December the 23rd on such and such a year, I tied my shoes at 323 PM. No, I just have vague memories of it all and they get put together. So the man is remembering back. And so A Child's Christmas in Wales is a memory piece, not unlike anything else that we have in our memories. We all share those things. And so all of these years later, I've, I've always looked forward to performing it, reciting it, living through it around Christmas time, which I'm getting ready to do now. But this year I found something very different. After all this time, I discovered something about this poem that I, that I had never found before. So the poem opens like this. One Christmas was so much like another in those years around the sea town corner. Now, they're out of all sound, except for the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep. And then the poem goes on to say, I can never remember 
whether it snowed for six nights and six days when I was twelve, or whether it snowed for twelve days and twelve nights when I was six. Very easy opening. No problem, really. And then the poem closes after the boy has gone through, or the man has gone through all the memories and told the story to the boy. After everything has happened, the poem closes like this. The boy leaves the party downstairs and goes up and goes to bed. And then here's what he says. Looking through my bedroom window out into the unending night and the smoke-colored snow, I could see the lights coming from all the houses on our hill, and I could hear the music rising from them up the long and steadily falling night. I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness, and then I slept. And for all of these years, I've never really known how to close the poem. And then I slept. I wasn't sure what it meant. But this year, I noticed the opening and the closing echo one another. The opening, one Christmas, was so much like another in those years around the Sea Town corner. Now they're out of all sound, except for the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep. Ah, I thought, this year, a moment before sleep. And then in the close, I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close in holy darkness. And then I slept. This year, I realized that maybe this entire story takes place in the small sliver of time, just a moment before the man is falling asleep. He may be alone. He may be trying to remember. There may be no boy at all in the poem or the story. It's just the man. That few seconds before sleep. And then when we come to the end, and then I slept. It closes down and he goes to sleep and there's nothing there. No more memories. No, no voices. No distant speaking voices. I learned that this year, all these years later. So am I still memorizing A Child's Christmas in Wales? Am I still learning it by heart? Might be fair to say, yes, I am. So as we close the show, as I get ready to say goodbye and say thank you ever so much for just listening to all of these ideas around memorization, please remember that Adam had him, we, me, whose woods these are, and a moment before sleep, Take it easy when you memorize. Pay close attention to the things around you. Allow yourself to enjoy the simple beauty that is always there in front of you. No matter what your circumstances are, you can always look to the left or to the right and see something that will strike your fancy, stir up your imagination. Something that will swirl once about your house and fall asleep on the porch. Maybe it's a cat, like the cats in a child's Christmas in Wales. And the cats in their fur abouts watch the fires and the high heat fires spat, all ready for the chestnuts and the mulling pokers. And another line I like in a child's Christmas in Wales goes like this. And the cold postman with the rose on his button nose tingled down the tea tray slithered run of the chilly glinting hill. He went in his ice-bound boots like a man on fishmonger slabs. He wagged his bag like a frozen camel sump, dizzily turned the corner on one foot, and by God he was gone. And here's one more scene from A Child's Christmas in Wales to close us out. To hail young men, their big pipes blazing, no overcoats and wind-blown scarves would trudge unspeaking down to the forlorn sea to work up an appetite, to blow away the fumes, who knows, to walk into the waves until nothing of them was left but the two curling smoke clouds of their inextinguishable briars. And when I was learning that scene, trying to get a, an image around it. I thought of my good friend Andrew Brown, and I thought of how Andrew and I 
many, many, many times walked through the woods at Warren Wilson College years and years ago when we were almost boys, and how we were hale young men, and sometimes we fancied we had pipes, and maybe we didn't walk into the sea, but we walked into the woods. So that was my image for those hale young men walking into the sea in A Child's Christmas in Wales. So as we close, I encourage you to memorize whatever you want, pay close attention to your environment, enjoy what you see, and, and trust your creative range. You were born with it, it's there, and it's available for you to use as much as you like. And on that note, I will say thank you ever so much for tuning in to Twice Five Miles Radio, an imaginative storm podcast offering you fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always broadcasting first on WPVMLP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online, WPVMFM.org, the voice of Asheville heard all over the world, and on other community radio stations like KCEI Cultural Energy Radio coming out of Taos, New Mexico. Thanks, Walter Parks, for the theme song. Song, WalterParks.com. Thanks to Veen Dial for all the help you do producing the shows at WPVMFM. You're a great manager. For more on community radio, WPVMFM.org. And if you'd like to join me any Saturday morning for the Imaginative Storm writing prompt of the week gathering, you'll always find the Zoom link at ImaginativeStorm.com. The door is open. There's never a charge. And finally, on December the 18th, 2022, at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be performing A Child's Christmas in Wales by Dylan Thomas. So if you'd like to attend, go to jamesnave.com, nave spelled N-A-V-E, and at the very, very bottom of, of the website, the page, the, the landing page, you'll find the events, and you will see A Child's Christmas in Wales. So if you just scan down to the bottom, there you will find it, and that's where the Zoom link will be. We'd love to have you. So, once again, thanks for listening to Twice Five Miles Radio. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, I'll catch you on that turnaround somewhere down the line.